All right, take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Now, uh, Genesis chapter 11 gives us a story of the Tower of Babel. It gives us a story of the confounding of languages and how the people were divided um, into nations because God had confounded the languages there. And I've heard, uh, just, I'm just going to mention it to you, but just total stupidity from people that want to deny the Bible, people that want to try to find contradictions in the Bible. They'll, they'll look at uh, Genesis chapter 10 and say, well, Genesis chapter 10 mentioned already that the nations were divided. And then we get to chapter 11, and we see the people coming together, making themselves of one name, of one language, and then they get divided again. What's going on? The contradiction in the Bible. I mean, that's just stupidity. Obviously, Genesis chapter 10 gives us a big picture, gives us an overview of what took place, gives us a breakdown of the nations, and then chapter 11 gives us the detail as to why the nations were divided. And it's very similar to Genesis chapter 1. It gives us the great picture of God's creation for the six days, and then Genesis chapter 2 takes us to the detail of day number 6 and tells us more about Adam and Eve. These are not contradictions, all right, just because one thing is before another. It's just the way God sees fit. And I think God makes perfect sense. He gives us a good way of, of giving us the Bible. Um, I was listening yesterday to uh, Sister Eve explaining that there's a, there's a church in America that have basically come up with their own Bible. They've taken, little, they've taken chapters or passages and mixed it all up so you can't just find a reference. You know, the church has decided what you should read in which order. But, you know, God has given us His Word, you know, His Word in perfect order for our understanding, you know, for, for His reasons so we can better understand His his word, all right? So there's no contradiction. If someone mentions that, they're just being stupid, honestly. I mean, I think even a non-believer can understand that. It's just someone that's, that hates God, that hates the Bible, that claims it's a contradiction. So Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now, this would be expected. Remember, Noah and his family came off the ark. You would expect that they're speaking the one language. Now, what that language was, we don't know, okay? We don't know what that language was. Some people say it was, must have been Hebrew, because, you know, they think of certain languages being very magical and special. We don't know what language they spoke, okay? Um, I'd be interested to know, but I don't think we can ever find out, you know, at least on this side of eternity. And uh, so, of course, they're speaking one language. Of course, the families, the children being born of these families. And then it says in verse number two, And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, Okay. Now, one thing I wanted to, one thing that I preached last week that I was then scratching my head and questioning, I, was, I mentioned this to Brother Sam, is sometimes when I get up to preach, now re remember, I'm a product of being in church my whole life, okay, since I was a child, literally, since I was born, I've been going to church, okay, and listening to preaching, and sometimes, you know, you listen to preaching, you hear the same thing said over and over again, and you can sometimes, you know, I can preach things, that I believe are true because I've heard it said so many times, but then when I preached it, I'm sort of scratching my head. Hold on, is that in the Bible or did I just think that because I've heard preaching about that for so long? And uh, one thing that I mentioned last, and I, I don't think I was incorrect, by the way, necessarily, but one thing I mentioned last week that I didn't really clarify with the Bible was I mentioned that Babel, now remember we talked about Nimrod and him being a king and Babel being one of the cities that he was king over? Well, I mentioned that Babel was Babylon. Okay, that Babel was Babylon. That's what I pretty much heard preaching my whole life. But as I went to investigate in the Bible, is that true? Can I, can I quantify that? Can I qualify that with the Bible? I, I found that I was, I was lacking a bit. Okay? But I'm not, saying that it's not, that, I'm not saying that Babylon is not Babel. I'm just saying I don't think we can be sure in the Scriptures. But there is one thing that I want you to notice in verse number 2, Genesis 11, verse 2. It says that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. So remember that the phrase, the plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, okay? Now, if you go back to the previous chapter, Genesis chapter 10, verse 9, where it mentions Nimrod, it says in, in verse number 9, that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, uh, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and look at this, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kelna, in the land of Shinar. Okay, so we have confirmation here that Babel is in the land of Shinar, right? Now, take your Bibles, keep your finger there, and turn to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, and if you know the book of Daniel, 
it tells us the story of the king of Babylon basically taking Judah into captivity. Okay, the king of Babylon being King Nebuchadnezzar. And it says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiada, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Just in case you're wondering, it was God that allowed you know, Nebuchadnezzar to take over Judah there. Amen. And then it says, with part of the vessels of the house of God. So from the house of God is a temple. They took, obviously, the gold, the precious things from the house of God. And it says here, which he carried into the land of Shina to the house of his God, that's Nebuchadnezzar's God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So this was the, 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 the biggest connection that we, could, we can get from the Bible, is that Babel was in the land of Shina, and so was Babylon. Okay, and so was Babylon. Now, does that mean they're exactly the same city? I don't believe we can actually know that. Okay, I, I did a lot of research, looked up every verse that I could find. I, I couldn't really determine that. But one thing is for certain is that Babylon took its name from Babel. Okay, took its name from Babel. So whether it's the same city or if it's the same city in a spiritual sense, Babylon was inspired by, by Babel. I'm not entirely sure. But hey, as a preacher, I like to come to you guys and just be honest. Say, this is what the Bible says. This is the best, you know, that we can understand it as. It may very well be Babel, like reconstructed, or it might just be influenced by Babel, that, that being Babylon, okay? But one thing you'll, you'll also notice is that these two cities are strongly connected, especially when it comes to the end times. But we'll get to that soon, all right? Back to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, verse 3. Genesis chapter 11, verse 3. And they said one to another, that's the people that uh, went to the land of Shinar, all, all the descendants of Abraham and his sons. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them freely. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. All right, so here's what's interesting about this, okay? It says they want to build a city and a tower. And of course, that city is known as Babel, okay? Now, it's not called Babel at this point in time. It's called Babel after God confounds the languages, okay? So I'm not sure what they would have named at this point in time. But you see one thing that you notice in verse 4, it says they want this tower to reach unto heaven, Okay? Now, one thing I don't really want to talk about all that much, but one thing I have heard that's, again, I just need to cover some things that are really stupid, okay? And this is the teaching of the flat earth. You know, people that believe in the flat earth, and I've heard one of the arguments, I don't know if this was online or by somebody, I can't remember exactly, was, well, this proves, verse number four, proves that the flat earth is true. Because the flat earth, if you know what they believe, they believe it's completely flat and there's a dome, um, above the earth, and basically all the stars, all the sun, the moon, all the, all the celestial bodies are either contained in that dome or, or in that dome. I'm not sure exactly, but basically it's not you know, how science today teaches it. And then they say, see, they were trying to penetrate through the dome. Because beyond the dome, that's where God lives. Okay? That's where heaven is. And if they can just penetrate that, that dome, they will be able to reach unto heaven. So therefore, these ancient people knew that if we just broke through that dome, we'll make it to heaven, you know? That's what I've heard taught, okay? Now, I was just thinking about that, and um, I mean, first of all, building a tower that large is just physically impossible, okay? That tall, that tall is just physically impossible, all right? So, I just did a little bit of research here, just for your information about that, but if you guys are familiar with Mount Everest, that's the highest point on the earth, right? The, the tallest mountain that we have on this earth, or it might not, be, it might not be the tallest mountain, but it reaches the highest peak. I think the, high, the largest mountain is like underwater or something like that. But as far as the highest peak that's on the earth, it's Mount Everest. And when, when, when you, you're probably familiar that a lot of people that have climbed Mount Everest have actually perished, have actually died. Why? Because when you get to a certain point, you know, the, 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 um, there's less oxygen, the air becomes, becomes thinner, and you, you, know, you don't get the oxygen, oxygen that you need in your body, and you can perish. That's why people that generally climb Mount Everest, if they want to make the peak, they'll also take oxygen tanks with them to, to make it all the way. 
So you get to about 8,000 meters before it's known as the death zone on Mount Everest. So imagine, obviously Mount Everest is not close to the dome or whatever, whatever it is. So imagine people trying to build a tower that tall. I mean, you're going to just start dying. <laughs> it's not going to be even, not only is it physically impossible, uh, uh, but not even a human being was not able to do it. Okay, would not be able to, you know, get a team of people building a tower that large. And once you get to about 8,000 meters, people are just going to start dying. Okay. Now, the average cruising altitude of a passenger plane, and they do fly. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of us have been on passenger planes. is is more than, is more than that. It's 10,600 meters. Okay, it's 10,600 meters, and we still not hit the dome. All right. And by then, you're obviously not going to be able to breathe properly. I mean, you're definitely going to perish at that point, at that height, okay? Now, I did a bit of more research. What's the highest that a passenger plane has flown? This was a Concorde jet, and they've flown 18,300 meters, okay? The reason why planes need to travel that high is because the air is thinner, and they can travel faster, less resistance, and they'll save on fuel as well, okay? So, Concords were very fast jets. They would have to get that high to be that fast. 18,300 meters. So obviously, they're still not hitting the dome at that point. My point is, it's impossible to build a tower that would literally reach beyond a dome, okay, and make it to heaven, okay? So that argument that I've, I've heard that argument, has anyone else heard that argument for the flat earth? You're like, we don't even look into that, Kevin. Why, why are you talking about that? <laughs> I, just, I just thought it was interesting, all right? I just get you some. But I've heard that towards, so I just wanted to cover that. It's impossible, all right? So obviously when they say they want it to reach unto heaven, remember, heaven is also the sky. It's also, you know, so they obviously just want a large tower, okay? And why do they want a very high tower? It said there in verse number four, and let us make us a name. It says, let's make a name for ourselves as, as people, as human beings. We start to see human beings after the flood imme almost immediately, you know, starting to lift themselves up with pride, you know, we need to make sure, you know, we're remembered, you know, for the, for the coming generations. And he goes, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. We don't want to be scattered abroad. We want to stick together. If we stick together, we can make a name for ourselves. And it's funny because it's, it's exactly what God does to them. He scatters them abroad. Okay, but verse number five. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. So I'm not sure exactly if this is... The Lord literally coming down, you know, uh, maybe a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ that's come and checked out the building, or it's just using it as a figure of speech. Uh, but they, the Lord had and was looking at what the children of men were building. And verse number six, and the Lord said, behold, the people is one. So that's awesome. The people are one. Isn't that what we're striving to do? You know, in 2019, is bring all the nations together, you know, to love one another, break down the walls of divisions of nations. You know, why should we have borders? Why should we have all these divisions and nations and languages? We should just be one people. Surely that's the goal, right? Surely that's what God wants. What's that, what does God say? Behold, the people is one, and they, all, they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. So this becomes a problem for the Lord. The Lord realizes when the people are one, it's bad business. It's bad for the world when human beings are all gathered and making a name for themselves as one. Okay, because they, mankind just lift themselves up, right? They start worshiping human beings, as it were. Now, one thing I want you to notice here, this is Babel once again. So we see all the people becoming one. Now, Keep your finger then, go back to Daniel. I should have told you to keep your finger in Daniel. But anyway, go back to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, we're looking at Nebuchadnezzar as the king of Babylon. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. One thing you'll notice, and as we go through this, is when the people become one, when the nations become one, the people think it's a great idea, we're going to make ourselves a name, but there's always someone that wants to get in there and make, them, make a name for just themselves. There's always someone that will come in and claim that authority, that power, for themselves. Okay? And this is Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. 
he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication to the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a Herod cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, okay, not just the people of Babylon, but all the nations it had power over, and languages. They're trying to bring all the people, all the nations, all the languages together to worship this image. Verse number five, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sakbats, sultry, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you, sh you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, have set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So do you see the problem? When you try to get all the nations, all the languages, all the people together for one purpose, there's always some wicked person there wanting to claim that power. There's always some wicked person there that will lift himself up. And here we have Nebuchadnezzar lifting himself up to be a god because he's asking for the, all the peoples of all languages and all nations to come and worship at his image. I mean, this is how it is, guys. Babylon, I guess maybe they started with an innocent thought. We the people, okay? What we see develop in Babylon is there will be a man that comes in and claims all that. Hey, so that's for me, okay? And of course, let's go now to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation chapter 17. Book of Revelation chapter 17. Because when we put these two things together, the Tower of Babel, and we put together Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, these two things give us a perfect picture of the Antichrist, the beast that would come in the tribulation period, okay? The Antichrist that would come and persecute the people of God. And in Revelation chapter 17, verse 7, Revelation chapter 17, verse 7, um, uh, John gets a vision of a harlot woman riding upon a beast, okay? And then he gives us the inter interpretation of what that is. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 7, the Bible says, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Drop down to verse 9. And here is the mind which have wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. We'll pay attention to this slowly. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. So at this point in time, five kings have already passed on. Okay? And then it says, or well, they're historical kingdoms is what they are actually. Okay? But I, want, I don't want to go into too much detail. And then it says, and one is. So at the time of John's writing, there was one uh, kingdom that is at that point in time. That's the Roman Empire. And then it says, and the other is not yet come. And this will be the kingdom, the authority, the power of the Antichrist. And then it says, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, this is the beast that the woman's riding on, and is not, even he is the eighth. So there's an eighth king. And then it says, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. So you might remember that the Antichrist is also known as the son of perdition. Okay? So here, we see that there's an eighth king, but it says he's of the seven. Say, so, well, how does that make sense? Well, because the seventh king is the Antichrist, and if you remember your Bible, the Antichrist will perish, and then he'll be brought back to life. Okay? And he'll be, when he gets brought back, he'll be empowered by the devil himself. He will be empowered by Satan. And so in a sense, he's the eighth because he's been resurrected, but he's of the seven because he was a seventh. Okay? That's what it's teaching there. And then in verse number 12, this is, the, this is the important bit here. Verse number 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. So these are future kings to come, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Now look at this. These have one mind. Hey, these are ten kings of ten kingdoms on the earth, and the Bible says they have one mind. You know what that reminds me of? Tower of Babel. 
one language, one people. Let us make a name for ourselves. All these nations, all these people gathered together. And what we see when this happens, it's problem. They create problems. Okay, It's not what God wants. God does not want a one world government. Okay, God does not want a one world police force. Hey, that's what, the, that's what the USA has become. You know, the international police force. They're the world's police force. They've got no business in the, in the affairs of other sovereign nations. Regardless of how wicked their governments are, regardless of how wicked their false religions are, hey, it's not for one nation to go into another nation and tell them how it needs to be. Okay, now it's a different thing if people are going to war. It's a different, that's a different issue. I don't want to cover that right now. But just going around and just flexing your muscles and saying, hey, we are one nation. Listen to us. That, that's the wrong way to go. When you start supporting, look, Christians should not be supporting nations conquering other nations. And, and because God has divided these things for a reason, He realizes when nations come together, when power is all uh, brought uh, centrally, it's problems. Problems. So we see these 10 kings here. Uh, verse number 13. These have one mind, and what do they do? And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. It's exactly what happens. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are, he, are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. So you see, when all the nations come together, give the power to the Antichrist, what happens? They want to make war against Jesus Christ. They make war against the Lord God. You see the problems that can come when our nations, our sovereign nations, try to get together and make themselves of one people, of one mind. Now, one thing I, I forgot to cover, um, if you can just go back to, you're in Revelation 17, so look at verse number 5. Revelation 17, verse 5, speaking of the, the mystery woman, the woman riding the beast, I forgot to mention her, sorry. It says here in verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. A lot of Christians have different opinions as what to what this uh, Babylon is, what this mystery Babylon is. But one thing you'll notice is that she was writing, what did it say in verse number one? So look, look at verse number one, just because I, I, I got confused with my thought there a little bit. But at the end of verse number one, it's talking about the woman. It says, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore, that sitteth upon many waters, right? And now look at verse number 15, Revelation 17, 15. What, what is this many waters that she sits upon? It says here, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Okay? So this whore that sits upon many waters has authority, has power, has influence over many people many nations okay so we see in the end times we the world is going to try this again the world is going to try this again and one great influence in that is this babylon okay is this babylon now i, I do believe that is a spiritual babylon okay that it's babylon as, as a figure that it's babylon as a spirit in a sense okay not literally babylon in iraq okay I mean, they could play a part. I don't know. You know? But here's the thing. You know, um, We definitely see the theme in the Bible that we see here, right? From Babel to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon and then to Mystery Babylon. And I did mention to you guys that many times the book of Revelation does tie in to a lot of things that the book of Genesis has set up. Okay? So look, nothing good comes from all being one. Nothing good comes from it. Okay? The United Nations... Ah, oh, such a good idea, all the nations coming together and talking about things. Look, it's nonsense. You know, the United Nations is just attempting to do exactly what the people in Babel tried to do. Okay, it's exa Look, now look, do I believe the United Nations is the kingdom of the Antichrist? No, I don't. Okay, because as we saw in the book of Revelation, is that these kings, the ten kings, don't have power yet, but when they do, they'll, they'll reign with, with the Antichrist for one hour, and they will give all their power to the Antichrist, I don't get caught up, and I would encourage you guys, don't get caught up with every little thing that happens in our globe, in our, in our you know, um, international communities and, and nations, all the little arguments and little agreements, and be like, man, this is prophecy now being you know, unfolded, and, and this is what's happening. And, or people talk about you know, sort of the mark of the beast and you know, every little upgrade to, to currency and how we exchange. Oh, man, is this the mark of the beast? No, don't, don't get too caught up on that. 
Because the Bible gives us clarity as to when we need to be aware of these things. Okay? And I've once heard you know, a pastor say, prophecy has a way of making you look stupid. You know? and absolutely, it's true. I mean, just go back to the 80s and read the prophecy books and look how stupid it is, right? I mean, it just can't happen now because the world has changed so much. And you just go, but you look, look through history, all the people that wrote about the end times, and people are always looking at, their, at the situation going, well, it must be now. It must be now. Look, just, just be mindful. You know, Jesus Christ has told us when that will be. And actually, let's go to that now. Go to Matthew 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, verse 14. And verse 14 is what we should be preoccupied with, by the way. Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So what should we be concerned with? Should we be concerned about how the nations are are combining, how they're separating, what's going on with the world? No, it says we should be preoccupied with preaching the gospel to all nations. That's what we should be concerned with when it comes to the nations. But then verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. All right. So Jesus tells us when we need to realize and how we're going to understand that we're now in those last days. He sees when we we see the abomination of desolation. And again, if you know your Bibles, that's when the Antichrist does something very similar to Nebuchadnezzar he creates an image or a statue or something about himself, okay? And people are called to come and worship that image. That's the abomination of desolation, okay? That stands in the holy place. When that happens, okay, and we see what happens as well, there's going to be ten kings that give the Antichrist that power. When all of that happens, that's when you'll really know we're now in the end times, okay? That's when you really know. The next world war may not bring in the end times. It could be World War Ten by the time we get there. Okay, the next upgrade to how we do currency. Now we've got, you know, we've got cryptocurrency or something. You know, it's not necessarily the mark of the beast. Okay, I mean, I remember just again, I grew up in the 80s, right? I was born in the 80s, and I remember seeing documentaries from churches and pastors and Christians, you know, and talking about the the barcodes and saying, you know, does this have a barcode? Anyway, you know, the barcodes. That's the mark of the beast. You know, you know, and, and then it's like, well. Well, now we've moved on from barcodes, right? I mean, we still use barcodes when we go shopping, but now everyone kind of realizes, well, it's just a good way of scanning products, you know? And then it's become, well, when we had credit cards and electronic banking, that's the mark of the beast! And then it became, you know, so, sort of more of a cashless society. And then there were smartphones, you know, and, and the, you know, your Apple phones and stuff, and that's the mark of the beast, you know? That's the mark there in your hand, in your, in your forehead, because you're, you're talking like this. That's the mark of the beast. And um, what else? Cryptocurrency, you know, Bitcoin and things like that. You know, that's the mark of the beast. Look, <laughs> look, obviously the Antichrist is going to use all this technology and devices for his purpose at his time. Okay? But that doesn't mean every little thing that happens. Now, I'm not in favor of all these. I'm not saying I'm in favor of all these things. Okay? But I'm, what I'm saying is it's not all the mark of the beast. You don't have to panic. Okay, when, when you find out on the news that someone's put an RFID chip into their hand or something, you don't need to panic. That's not the mark of the beast. Now, I'm not, am I saying that's what you should do? I, w- I would never do it. I mean, I don't even vaccinate my kids. I don't want any foreign objects into my body or into my kids' body. I don't think it's a wise thing to do at all. Okay? But when the mark of the beast comes, it's going to be obviously a number, 666, which is the number of his name. Say, so what does that mean? We'll know when the time comes what that means. Trust me, we'll know what it means. And you're going to be required to worship the beast and Satan himself, the dragon. Okay? When that happens, that's the mark of the beast. Okay? That's the mark of the beast. So don't panic about every little technological advance that happens. I'm sure the, the Antichrist is going to be driving a car as well. That doesn't mean it's evil. Okay? It doesn't mean driving a car is evil or anything like that. So you know, don't be overly concerned. Like, you know, be watchful. Jesus Christ says to be watchful. Be aware. Pay attention. But don't freak out about every little thing. You should be concerned about making sure the gospel is going out to the nations. Okay? So, we see then that when nations gather together, they're lifting themselves up eventually against the Lord. Now, go back to Genesis chapter 11, please. Genesis chapter 11, verse number 7. Genesis chapter 11, verse number 7. So, obviously, the Lord knows what man is able to do. 
And then he says this to himself. He, he's, this is the, the words of the Lord. He says, go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Now, I just love again verse number seven because God says to himself, let us go down. What's that confirming for us? The plurality of God. And of course, we believe in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we say the Lord speaks, you know, maybe the Father speaking to the Son or, you know, whatever way you want to look at that. And we see that the Lord wants to confound their languages. And see, God is the author of languages, okay? Every language has beauty in it, okay? Every language is very intelligent. You know, my kids, sometimes they come up with their own language. But it's, sorry kids, but it's nonsense, <laughs> right? I mean, I think Sebastian, just, what is it, just yesterday or the day before, he was coming up with his own language. He goes, you know, you know in my language, when you want to say this, you, you say, do you remember any of that, Nick, uh, Sebastian? Can you give me one example? Panajog is what? What's that? Okay, Jonathan is Panajog. Okay, that's, that's the kind of language we... If we were creating languages as ourselves, that's what we'll come up with. Okay, every language is complex, is beautiful, you know, and um, it's the law that came up with them, okay? And I, I know the languages we have today are not necessarily the languages they spoke then, but obviously they've been built upon... You know, even our English language has been built on several other languages. You know, it has had a Germanic influence, you know, Latin influence, th things like that. And, uh, and this is why, again, you know, in Acts chapter 2, when they... Um, receive the power of the Holy Ghost to speak in other tongues. You know, the Lord was able to just give him that ability because, again, it's, it, the Lord is, is God over languages, okay? So languages are a beautiful thing. If you're able to learn more than one language, I really encourage you to do that. You never know how you might be able to use it in the future with preaching the gospel to all nations. And uh, verse number eight, verse number eight, so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. So exactly what they didn't want, <laughs> you know, God brought that in. So of course, you know, you're building something together and all of a sudden your co-workers speak in a totally different language. I mean, let's say the guy starts speaking Mandarin, you know, and you're just like, there's no translators. <laughs> there's no one there trying to tell you well, what he means by that is this, because everyone's now speaking some other language, you know, and they can't communicate properly, so they can't work together and then obviously they can't communicate um, and they, they leave off and stop the, stop the work there. And then they're scattered upon all the face of the earth. All right. So, and then it says here in verse number nine, therefore the name of it is called Babel. Okay. Now notice this. So it's after the Lord's confounded the languages. It says, therefore, the reason for the, the reason that it's named this or given this is, is the name, sorry, therefore is the name of it called Babel. Okay. So it wasn't Babel before, but once the languages were confounded, it became Babel, because it says now, because the Lord did there confound the languages of, the, of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So we still have that word in our English language, Babel, we use that, you know, and Babel just means exactly what was defined there in verse number nine, it's confusion, okay? Uh, hearing con confusing noise, uh, noises, that's, that's when you talk about someone that's babbling, or, you know, um, it's just, you know, confusing, unknown words that are being said, you know. We might say that little babies, you know, babble, you know, say, say sort of nonsense things that no one really understands. Um, and yeah, that, that's where we get it from, okay. So one thing I did want to talk about very quickly here as well is that you notice that when people don't speak the same language, they can't work together, okay. I mean, that's just, so the principle that I want to take out of that here is that, look, I'm all for immigration, you know, I, I think Australia is a wonderful nation. I think we have a lot of land. I think we're very rich. We've got a lot of uh, resources. And I'm very thankful as, as a son of immigrant parents. You know, my parents came from Chile, okay? They obviously spoke Spanish. And, you know, my father had the skills to, to be, you know, basically to, to receive a, a visa to come into Australia and, and work for this nation, obviously, to bring his skills here. And so I'm very thankful for Australia, okay? But one thing my parents did very wisely, and I believe all immigrants should be, you know, anyone that wants to immigrate to, let's say, Australia, they should learn the language. Learn the language. Because when you don't learn the language, you can't communicate, you can't work together. And I get frustrated, not so much here on the Sunshine Coast, but down in Sydney, because it's a lot more multicultural. You know, you go and knock on a door, I don't speak English. I want to give them the gospel, right? I mean, look, thankfully, we've we got some apps now. We've got some technology that can actually, you can actually give people the gospel in another language. You can just play it out there. So I'm thankful for that. Hey, but, you know, 
people are never going to be able to, you know, integrate into society if they don't learn the language. And I truly believe, I'm, I'm, I'm all for immigration, but I truly believe whoever immigrates to our nation should learn English, to be able to work with us, to be able to be part of the same people of, of uh, you know, of Australia. And I'm really thankful for my parents because, you know, they, they came on in a visa, you know, uh, they didn't have to, my dad didn't have to start working immediately. I think he took a, a year or two. Um, he was doing uh, language classes, so did my mother. And then, obviously, in the early years, they were going to a Spanish church, Spanish Baptist church, and then they said, look, we want our kids to learn English. We don't want them to be confused with the language. We want them to be able to, assert, you know, not just be, you know, all one people, just the Spanish people gather. That's what happens. When, when people don't learn the language, you just have all the people gathered together, and then you've got these ethnic groups within the one nation, and people are just not able to really get along, okay? And a lot of times, they bring their, their historic problems that they had in their other nations and bring it here and cause problems in Australia. You know, I, I love this country. I, I, don't love, I don't love what it's becoming, okay, but I do love what this country is able to provide for people that immigrate here. But I truly believe that should be one of the rules, just learn the language. I mean, that's just a, a basic thing. So we, we see that from the Bible. When you don't learn the language, you're divided, you can't work together, and these people then are brought into separate nations. All right. Now, what, what stupid teaching out there by the Ruckmanites is that, see, this proves that you shouldn't marry, um, you know, within other nations. You shouldn't have interracial marriage, you know. And they look down, some of these Ruckmanites, you know, if you don't know, they're disciples of Peter Ruckman, okay, and they're usually more extreme than Peter Ruckman himself. And so a lot of them believe you shouldn't marry someone of another race, you know. But what we saw here is we're all one blood. We've already seen that. We're all one blood, but they think because God's divided these, that's why you shouldn't intermarry, you know. It's just, it's just a stupid, stupid teaching that's out there, okay? Um, I mean, even, even Moses married an Ethiopian woman, okay? I mean, Joseph, a great man in the Bible, married an Egyptian. And we could go on and on, you know, in the Bible about people marrying from other nations. And uh, verse number 10, please, verse number 10. These are the generations of Shem. Now, remember, Shem would be then the progenitor of the Israelites to come. So it says here, these are the generations of Jem, Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. Okay? So obviously we know Shem was on the ark. But now we're going to start looking at people that were born after the flood. All right? And I want you to pay attention to how old they were when they started having kids. Okay? So verse number 11, And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad 500 years. Now that's still a long time. People are still living a very long time, but it's almost half of what they were living prior to the flood. Remember they were almost getting to a thousand years? Well now, fact said, I mean, I, I, 500 years, that's, that's a long time, okay? But it's half of what they were living before the flood. So we start to see a change in the biology of man. You know, God has brought about some change into human beings there. And then uh, it says he begat sons and daughters. Verse number 12, And fact said, lived five and thirty years and begat Selah. So he was 35, okay? And Arphaxad lived after he begat uh, Selah 403 uh, three years and begat sons and daughters. And Selah lived 30 years and begat Eber. Now, if you remember, I took you to the New Testament where Eber is pronounced Heber, and that's where they use, that's where we get the term the Hebrews from. Okay? Not to say that everybody born of Eber was a Hebrew, I'm just saying that's where the, the term comes from. And then verse number 15 And Selah lived after he begat Eber 403 years and begat sons and daughters. And Eber lived four and thirty years and begat Peleg. So it was 34 when Peleg was born. Now, if you guys can go back to Genesis chapter 10, please. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 25. Genesis chapter 10, verse 25. Remember what it was said of Peleg? It said here in verse number 25, And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. And I strongly believe that division is what we see in the Tower of Babel, okay, when all the nations were uh, separated. Um, so, if Peleg, the reason he was called Peleg is because his name means that the earth, uh, the earth was divided, this gives us an idea of when the Tower of Babel, when the events of the Tower of Babel took place, right? Because it must have happened, and then for Peleg to be named that name, all right? And it said there uh, in verse number, sorry, Genesis 10.25, Right? The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. 
So Peleg must have been basically a newborn, must have just, you know, because you, you generally give people a name when they're born, or, or soon after they're born, okay? So in Peleg's days, he was given that name because that's when the earth was divided. So this gives us uh, an idea of how long after the flood, the events of the Tower of Babel took place, okay? Now, this is, this is easy, kids, or well, maybe it's not that easy, but kids, start paying attention now when I test your maths. Adults, you as well, but I'll let the kids answer first if they can. Let's work out how long after the flood um, it took to the events of the Tower of Babel, okay? So remember, if you go back to verse number, let's have a look. Verse number 10, verse number 10. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. So we're going to start with what number after the flood? Two years, yeah? Okay, start adding these numbers up now in your mind, okay? And then uh, verse number 12, verse number 12. And Arphaxad lived five and thirty years and begat Selah. So 35 plus 2 is 37. All right, good. Now, you guys just keep it in your mind. Now, look at verse number 14. So we're up to 37. You're going to have to add something to 37. Verse number 14, And Selah lived 30 years and begat Eba. Don't give me the number, just keep it in your mind. Okay, so you've got to add 30 years. Drop down to verse number 16. And Eba lived 4 and 30 years, that's 34, and begat Peleg. So we now need to add another 30, 34 years on top of that. Okay, which kid has the answer? Yes, Nicholas? 101. So Peleg was born 101 years after the flood. Okay, so that gives us an approximate time of when the events of the Tower of Babel took place. Not that long after the flood. Not that long, you know. It didn't take long for man to want to start elevating themselves even after God destroyed um, the entire world, you know. So it's just a, it doesn't give me much hope for mankind, right? I mean, mankind's not going to sort out this place. It's, it's going to just come from Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ comes, sets up his millennium, that's when we're going to be living exactly the way the Lord wants us to live on this world, okay? So I'm just looking up, I'm looking forward to Christ. I don't think Donald Trump's our savior. You know, I don't believe any politicians out there is going to get things how we want it as believers, as the Bible teaches, until the days of Christ coming in his kingdom. All right, so just a bit of uh, fun there going for the, for the ages there. Now look at verse number 17, Genesis chapter 11, verse 17. And Eber lived, and again, pay attention to how old they were, are when they're having kids. And Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. And Peleg lived 30 years and begat Ryu. And Peleg lived after he begat Ryu 209 years and begat sons and daughters. And Ryu lived 2 and 30 years and begat Serug. So you see a lot of these guys have kids around the age of 30, okay? But again, keep in mind, these guys are also living for some hundreds of years, okay? Verse number 21, and Reuel lived after he begat Serag 207 years and begat sons and daughters. And Sirag lived 30 years and begat Nahor. And Sirag lived after he begat Nahor 200 years and begat sons and daughters. And Nahor lived 9 and 20 years and begat Terah. Okay, so Terah would be the father of Abraham. And Nahor lived after he begat Terah 119 years and begat sons and daughters. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram. Nahor and Haran. Okay, so Terah is the father of Abram, and we know Abram, his name would become Abraham, okay? And he's obviously a very famous person in the Bible. Now, you could read verse 26 and think, well, Terah was 70 years old and he had triplets. That's what it sounds like if you just took it like that, right? He had triplets. But just like when we saw the sons of Noah, remember there was a certain order? It was like Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But then we looked at, well, is that who was Shem the oldest? And he wasn't. It was Japheth was the older. And we had looked at Ham was the youngest, okay? And the reason I gave you, well, the reason for that is because God usually puts the, the first name, the, the person of um, prominence in the Bible first when he comes to the brothers, okay? And of course, we know that Abram would be given the promise of God, you know, and he would have great faith, and then we'd have the Israelites that would ultimately descend from Abraham. That's why Abram is mentioned first. But Abram may be the youngest. He may be, I'm not 100% sure if he's the youngest, but he may be the youngest. Now, let's have a look at this. Because it says here that Terah lived 70 years and he begat children. Okay? So we know his first sons were born, or first son was born when he was 70. All right? But how old 
was, was he really, when he gave birth, well, not when he gave birth, but when he had Abram, how old was he really? So let's, let's do a little bit of uh, research here. Let's take our Bibles and turn to um, Genesis chapter 11, please. Oh, sorry, Genesis chapter 12. Actually, no, um, back to Genesis 11, just the last verse for, uh, first. Genesis chapter 11, verse 32. Pay attention now, guys. Get your maths brains working once again. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So how old was he when he died? 205 years. So put that number in your brain. It was 205 years when Terah passed away. Now, look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. So now the Lord calls Abram out of Haran. Okay? And this happens, look at this, in chapter 12, verse 4. And Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. Uh, and Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. Okay? So Abram was how old? 70 and 5 years. 75 years when he departed Haran. And he departed after his father passed away. So how old was Abraham? Sorry, how old was Terah when Abraham was born? What would be the equation there? Well, I'll let you know it's easy. So we know he died when he was 205. Okay? And then when God calls Abraham after the father passed away, he says here that Abraham was 75. All right? 70 and 5. So the answer is 205 take away 75. Who's got the answer? Yes, Isabel? 130. Okay, so Terah was 130 years old when Abram was born. Okay, so that's why I think he's the youngest because he was 70 when he had his first son, and then he was 130 when Abram was born. So there's plenty of time there to have, obviously, another child. And um, so, yeah, hope that's kind of interesting. Go back to Genesis 11, verse 27. Genesis chapter 11, verse 27. It says, Now these are the generations of Terah. Tira begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. So Lot is another famous person in the Bible. Lot's father is Haran, and so that would make Lot the nephew of Abram. Okay? And verse 28, and Haran died before his father Tira. And I, be, I actually believe Haran is the oldest son. Okay? I believe Haran was the one that was born when Tira was 70. And the reason is because we read here, this is Haran died before his father Tira in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. Now look at this, verse 29. Now this is, this is going to shock you a little bit, but hey, it's what happened. And, and Abram and Nahor, so the two brothers, took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and she would become Sarah in the Bible. And if you remember, Sarah was Abram's half-sister. Okay, She was the daughter of his father, but not the daughter of his mother. Okay, So Terah had another wife, or had relations with another person, and Abraham marries his half-sister. And you're like, oh, no. <laughs> That's what happened, all right? This is before the Levitical law. This is before um, Moses gave the law and prevented these kinds of marriages, okay? But that's not the worst part. Well, I don't know. That, maybe that is the worst part. But look at, look at, uh, look at uh, uh, Nahor, because Nahor also took a wife. And it says here, uh, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran. Who was Haran? That was his brother. So Nahor marries his niece. Okay? He marries his brother's daughter, the father of Milcah and the father of Iscah. So obviously Nahor marries Milcah, who was a daughter. That's why I believe Terah was the oldest. And then probably uh, Nahor and then um, Abram last because Nahor marries the daughter of his, I believe, his older brother, uh, Terah. Okay, so if you've got some other thoughts on that, uh, let me know as to you know who came first. But yeah, it's it's a bit unusual. We'll, we'll look at that today and go. That's a bit unusual marrying your niece or marrying your half sister. But again, you know these people were biologically different. I mean, they're living for hundreds of years. Okay, so they don't have the same corruption in their genetics as we do today. And this is prior to the law being given by Moses. Okay, so it's all cool. It's all good. Okay, they're not sinning. They're not doing anything wrong. It's just the way it was. And of course, we know that obviously when Adam and Eve being the first parents. I mean, even Noah coming off the flood with the three sons, you know, their, their children had to marry, you know, at least their cousins or something. 
you know, so just how it was. And um, verse, number, verse number 30, verse number 30. But Sarai was barren, she had no child. Now I just want to stop there for a moment because, again, these people, I truly believe, are biological, biologically superior than us, okay? And even in those days, we have a woman who's very faithful. She's even named in Hebrews chapter 11, in the Hall of Fame, with all these other great men of God, Sarah is mentioned as being a faithful woman. Hey, not only is she biologically superior, but she's a godly, faithful woman, and even she had difficulties. The Bible claims, says here, that she was barren. You know, she was, she was struggling to have children. She was barren, she had no child. And we know, of course, that Sarah would ultimately will have a child, but she only has the one child, okay? And I just want you, you know, especially ladies that might, struggle with this issue okay and i remember when i got married well before we got married my wife was told she'd not be able to have any kids you know and um you know for a lot of ladies that makes them feel like less of a woman you know it makes them feel that you know they're they're sort of this you know you know just just low you know just they feel really low about themselves and they beat themselves up and and uh, but here's the thing look even a faithful godly woman even a woman who was biologically biologically superior you know, was barren, okay? And yet God holds her up. God names her there in Hebrews chapter 11. What a great honor to be named amongst them, okay? So if this is an area, ladies, that you're struggling in, you know, take hope, you know, get strength in the word of God because Sarah's not the only one that was barren. Many ladies in the Bible were, was barren. This is a normal thing. This happens in life. You're not a second-class citizen. You're not less than a woman, Okay, Sarah was used for a great purpose by God. And look, even if it's just the one child, if that's all God gives you, praise God. Praise God for what God gives you. God will give you exactly what He needs. He knows that you need to have. Okay. Verse number 31. Verse number 31. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees, to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. I don't want to talk too much about that, but obviously they go into the land of Canaan, and then in the next chapter we're going to learn a lot more about Abraham and his family. So we'll leave it there for now, guys. Um, let's pray.